Oh, bigger. Oh. Welcome back to another episode with Fight Night Picks. As always, we're brought to you by Simbody. Vertiball is now Simbody. If you head on over to their website, simbody.com, you're going to get all the great products that you know and love, including the Simbody Vertiroller and the Vertiball that you have seen most likely here in studio. Look at that. Place it, lock it, attach it, Vertiball, all sorts of great stuff over there if you want to roll out those old tired muscles and you don't want to go with that old lacrosse ball. They're also coming out with that very new product that you can see right in front of you. And if I head on over to my cart, look at that. I've already got a Vertiball over there. A little bit of a deal right there. And if you hit the try for 60 days risk-free, use the promo code FNP and you're going to get 10% off your order. With that code FNP at Simbody.com, you're really really helping out another local company here in new brunswick canada can't wait for it the new name simbody at simbody.com and as we always say let's get into it a last look at the big car be sure to head into the chat and have your say let's get into it and join in fight night picks question mark kicks Oh boy, and just like that, we're back. We're set for Fight Night Picks Question Mark Kicks. Wow, it's been a few weeks since been. we've been live for this one. I was going back down through, changing out some of the slides to get ready for the show. And it made me realize just how excited I was. Four Question Mark Kicks, UFC Paris coming up today. Gone versus Tui Voss in the main event. Number one versus number three. Number one versus number two in the middleweight division in the co-main event. Robert Whitaker taking on... Marvin Vittori, as always, thanks so much to everybody that's tuning in over in the chat. We have AG, Chris, Prince Vegeta, Son, Cole Hughes, Malone Hart, Pulse Reloaded, Chris Air, Cote, Austin Laxon, Ian Campbell. Everyone's here. Danny Mora is over there. Alex Ramirez, do you know former uh, middle infielder for the Chicago White Sox? Is that you? Is that Alexi Ramirez? I was thinking of Manny, but okay. Just the Slim Reaper doing the damn thing every year. D-Rod, one Everybody hanging out. Rob Lawrence as well. Excited for this card. Matt, I checked it last night when I was doing everything up. And it still hadn't changed. And then I checked today. And they changed the bout order completely once more. So a couple of fighters really getting their due up closer to the top half of this card. There's eight middleweights on this one. They all weighed 186 pounds. That's weird. Like really weird. You don't see that very often. But again, should be a great one. Todd Johnson, the Canadian Connection, is back. And Orlando is saying, let's go. So thank you so much. Keep hitting up that chat. We'll go down through. If this is your first time tuning in for Fight Night Picks Question Mark Kicks, A, we thank you for the commitment because it's early on a Saturday. I kind of like these shows like a lot. It gets you really set up for the day and then you get to watch the fights. I like the show. I just hate waking up early if I'm being honest. Well, you get your evening, but Matt, it should be a lot of fun. Landon's saying feels like not many underdogs are going to win. Landon, you didn't like the picks I had this week then. But Matt, I know we are getting ready for a great card and there's a lot of different picks for fight of the night. There's a lot of really exciting fights too. This is one of the better fight night cards I feel like we've had in a very long time. It's really nice that they're going to Paris and they're going to France and they are giving those fans a fight card that they deserve. Not just the fact that Cyril Gaon, a hometown guy, is going to be in the main event, but this is just a really important fight for the division and an important card for the whole entire fight. Uh, Lone Hart, with the biggest super chat there's ever been in a Fight Night Picks episode. Glad to have you all back. Where is my number one fan award? Ha ha. Listen, you know what? There's a couple of trophies here. So again, for this week, Fight Night Picks all prediction you. MVP. It's all yours. You get it. Malone Hart doing the damn thing in the Thank super you, Malone. Chat. That's Thank very, Thank you very, very nice. much. But yeah, you're right. Like, you look at this card, and then you look at the, the pay-per-view next week, UFC 279. There's some good fights. I can get excited about it. And I will get excited about it in the videos. But, like, it's not that. Like, I'm excited about Melissa Martinez, but she hasn't fought for, like, three years well, making her debut. To quote the famous George St. Pierre, it is kind of like the stock market. You know, like, sometimes a pay-per-view is going to, you know, not really be worth the, all the money that you're going to spend on it. Sometimes a fight night card is going to be borderline pay-per-view value. And I feel like that's kind of what we're getting this weekend and next weekend. But I think this fight card is going to deliver. And hopefully the France crowd really does show up to give the UFC more enticement to just go back in the future. It has been really nice to see them go to Europe a lot more as of late. So hopefully they can just sort of unlock another market in France going forward. Yeah, France been 
been doing great. Europe's been doing great. Canada's been doing terrible with MMA. Just absolutely Down awful. Bad. We throw it on over to our fight of the night screen. Matt. Nasruddin Imovov taking on Joaquin Buckley. When I started the show, I said that they re-opt and changed everything around. This fight's up near the top of the main card. You have the ranked fighter, Nasruddin Imovov. Unranked Joaquin Buckley. Joaquin Buckley. Walking highlight reel. Knockout machine. Nasruddin Imovov. The only loss in the UFC. Majority decision to Phil Hawes. In a fight that could have gone either way, Imovov had success in the striking. Will it be slight periods of inactivity, but more accurate striking out of Nasruddin Imovov? Will it be the big actions of Joaquin Buckley? We're going to find out this weekend. It's a really volatile matchup, though, and that's why I'm, I am really excited for this fight. For Joaquin Buckley, we all know him for the highlights, but... He does have to have a really quality win on his record at some point. This is a great opportunity for him to actually achieve that. Nasty and Imovov, like you said, very accurate guy. Someone who will make use of his power shots. So I think this is going to be a really fun fight between these two fighters. And an important one too, because Imovov, like, I even forget that he's ranked half the time, if I'm being honest. Like, he's a very skilled fighter. I really enjoy watching him fight, watching him compete. But he's another guy who kind of needs to get his name out there a little bit more. And I think a big win over Joaquin Buckley is going to help him do that. Yeah, Imovov had a really interesting 2021. And I see it over there in the comments section. We got... Uh, the goat ram is saying let's go imovov uh we look at our next fight match Jordan versus nathaniel wood now mr wood weighing in for his second ever fight at featherweight look great and he's going to be taking on charles Jordan, who was in a really interesting fight his last time out against shane burgos both of these guys fought very very recently so that's another interesting thing you look at it in terms of damage Jordan got out wrestled by the boxer shane burgos okay. And for Nathaniel Wood, he kicked the legs off of Charles Rosa and didn't really absorb a lot of damage. So throwing both guys back in there, I think this is going to be a great one. Eric Cote saying Jordan and Wood will be fight of the night. Anthony saying, are you two French Canadians? Bilingual Canadians, I guess. We're not French. From the only bilingual province in Canada. Wild fact. stuff, Anthony. Wild stuff. Uh, but when it does come to this one, Matt, for Monsieur uh, Charles Al Jordan. Great opportunity, and same can be said for the prospect. Change the nickname, Nathaniel Wood. <laughs> it's a phenomenal fight between these two guys, and it's a readjustment <laughs> fight, it feels like. Because, okay, Jolday, you got a ranked opponent your last time out in Shane Burgos. I guess no lo potentially future ranked with the PFL, we'll call him, uh, Shane Burgos. And for Nathaniel Wood, had a really quality win over Charles Rosa, but it's not like the Charles Rosa of 2015, of 2016. It was a good win to sort of stamp him into the You mean the like division. the Dennis Seaver Charles Rosa? Yeah, exactly. Like, there's been better versions of Charles Rosa, that's all. So, I you feel like this fight for Nathaniel Wood is really going to let us know, okay, how good can he be at this weight class? Because even if you're going to beat a guy like Charles Jolday, you're not just going to run him over. It is going to be a grueling fight. It's going to be a tough fight. So I don't know how this fight isn't going to deliver, if I'm being completely honest. I would be extremely surprised if these guys just go in there and have an absolute dud for 15 minutes. Uh, Chris McDowell saying, I hear Jolday all day. Ryan Whitaker saying hi from New Zealand. Now you're from New Zealand. Do you root for the Anzac guy in Robert? We will find out, Matt. Hopefully. And I'll say this too. Yeah. Air Jolday might be my favorite nickname in all of mma i'm yeah, not it's pretty kidding. good it's pretty good it's top tier it's not that bad so fight night picks question mark kicks we ripped down through the entire card and i said it in the video and i bet it got lost in the shuffle i said eileen perez she's got dunks everybody probably thought craig but we're not we're not stop talking about basketball Who is boys she, tristan thompson what did she do with the weigh-ins folks you saw exactly what i was talking about she definitely does have dunks but when you look at eileen perez she's going to be taking on stephanie egger egger takes this fight on incredibly short notice, I want to make sure that I look through the notes just to talk about how short notice it really is. Because if you do figure out this fight for Stephanie Edgar, obviously she had the fight not that long ago. Maeda Bueno Silva in that one. She gets submitted very quick. Uh, we've got All She Can Lose saying Eileen Perez wins. Go Ramis, Eileen's going to win. She's going to twerk. Folks, I, this is the only thing I have to say. Have you ever watched her fight? Have you only seen her weigh in? Have you ever watched an Eileen Perez fight? You have lots of time. You can go on to YouTube, watch her fight. She's beating terrible competition in Brazil. Terrible. I she agree. looks good. Her striking's good. It's well-rounded. She She's a good kickboxer. She throws a low kick. Her entries are very good for a takedown. She's a body lock takedown type of fighter. She's very, very big in terms of, uh, you know, her ground and pound over submission ability. For me, Eileen Perez, though... It's just, she hasn't really fought that upper echelon of competition. Now, Stephanie Egger's an unranked women's bantamweight. I was going to say, it's there's, not like she's There's, there's right five right. of them, but her background, black belt in judo at the highest level, ADCC, very, very highly accredited with her jiu-jitsu as well, black belt in that discipline. For me, you're coming in on short notice, you're taking on Stephanie Egger. It's a great opportunity for Eileen Perez. But when I do look at this fight, Matt, I mean, I think Stephanie Edgar, just based on the experience, that's why I have to pick her in this one. 
Her striking is really one-dimensional. She doesn't throw much volume at all. It's about a third of the average, the UFC average, is what Stephanie Edgar throws. She'll paw a jab, throw a right hand to tie you up like a hockey player, and then go for the upper body takedowns. That's just where, when I look at Edgar Perez, and when I look at Jarno Aarons and William Gomez, I say, okay, for Eileen Perez, she needs upper body takedowns to take down Stephanie Edgar. Could it happen? Sure. But that's Stephanie Edgar's bread and butter. This is what I will say, though. Because this has been very heavy Stephanie Edgar, I would say, up until right now. Stephanie Edgar fights a lot like Paul Craig to where she's going to take advantage of your mistakes, but she will be in bad positions throughout some of her fights, and that is the truth. With Edgar, it might not always look great, but the results have been there at the UFC level. The only hesitation I have with being overly confident with Stephanie Edgar is we have seen her get out wrestled two times in the octagon, and at a certain point, if you are that natural grappler, if you are that high-level grappler, you shouldn't be getting out grappled by other fighters. Now, I don't think Perez is going to be able to go in there, take her down, get on top like she's Kayla Harris, and put a beating on her, because I do like the ground control of Stephanie Egger, and I think that if Egger's on bottom, she's still a dangerous fighter. If Egger's on top of Perez, then it's almost a recipe for disaster for Island Perez. I just don't know how she's going to be able to get back up to her feet if Egger ever does get that dominant position on her. I think that's going to be a really difficult matchup. Yeah, like, to me, I go and I watch this, like, the Stephanie Egger fight against Shannon Young, and you can say what you want about Young, but you look at it for Egger, and her striking wasn't all that great. She was getting, you know, outstruck by the karate fighter and Young, and then once Egger was able to take it to the Matt, man a crucifix she's able to get the finish the fight against jessica rose clark she's going up against the wrestling of clark and in that one she's able to get the submission win you have a look at the odds in this one i know the chat very very high on perez in this one sean v will see how perez looks like against somebody other than a soccer mom well you you said it uh for stephanie Edgar, open to minus 145 she's minus 261 average best fight odds perez at a plus 209 you know my feelings on this one uh, the pick for me is Egger. So there's a lot of people over there talking about Eileen Perez. Obviously, you know, being the younger fighter, longer shelf life in the UFC, so they probably would sooner see Perez get the oh, win here in this matchup. And this one kind of one off at 145. Perez is a bantamweight. Egger is a bantamweight fighter. So the pick here, both with Stephanie Egger. Yep. All right. No move. confidence in it, though, if I'm being honest. Like someone had said it, a 35 year old in the bantamweight division who got her start in MMA kind of late. Not the most confident I would be, uh, just kind of projecting a fighter in the future. So, for Edgar, this would be an important win for him. But, like you had said, it does sort of feel like the UFC wants Perez to win this one. Yeah, and I mean, for the late mate saying, dude, picked Edgar, and you're laughing. I do hundreds of these a year. Who cares, late mate. Craig? Good job, no. bud. Kali Taha is taking on Christian Quinones. And, Matt, this was a fight that we were split on were. at the start of the week. We made the mistake. We said that Bruno Silva was the, the juicy boy. But, really, it was Kali Taha was. in that fight against Bruno Silva. So, the apologies to Bruno Silva. But, for Taha, the UFC run hasn't been, like, the run up to the UFC. And, if you've only watched Taha in the UFC, obviously, 1-3 and three with an no contest. and no contest would have been a win. But when you watch him fight, he's an all-or-nothing guy. And that was the story before he came into the UFC. So as I had mentioned, when I was watching the build-up for this one, I went back and thought, I need to kind of clear my palate. You know, you need like a piece of lettuce or, or something really mild, just something basic to get a good read on Khalid Taha. So I went and watched a lot of pre-UFC tape. And this guy's knocking guys out, and he's being really aggressive, and his defensive grappling's not very good, but he does throw with great intent, and he puts everything into his shots. And for Bantamweight, in a division where there actually are a lot of finishes, you like to see that. For Christian Quinones, he's kind of a jack-of-all-trades type of guy. He'll strike on the outside. He can mix it up with his grappling. We know he has five-round cardio. We saw that with UWC, where he was a champ. It's just, when you do look at Christian Quinones... He hasn't really taken on that upper, upper echelon of competition. That's tough to do in the regional scene. We know that. Wait, I mean, we just said that uh, for Perez, that was a big knock against her, was that she didn't fight yeah, anybody okay, good in the regional For scene. Eileen Perez, we go through no, no, the, I agree the with records you. I'm just again. 0-1, one, 0-2. Oh I... For a guy like Christian Canones, he's taking on good regional talent. You're just not taking on the upper echelon of talent. Danny Matos, who's 20-7. Uh, Long Zhao over on, or Zhao Long over on Contender Series, 22-6. and six. Like, for Quinones, decent level competition. It's just regional level competition. And he's been able to get a lot of experience out there with a lot of wins and a lot of fights. So in this matchup, 
It is a tough one. Obviously, Taha's taken on the better fighters. But what's the pick in this one? The weird thing is, I think Kionez can have a lot of success with his volume striking because for Kali Taha, he's someone who will either shell up to defend himself or try to respond with his own big power shots. So I can see it being a fight where Kionez is looking really good until he doesn't. Now, I'm not someone who tries to rely on somebody to win by knockout to win a fight. I'm not picking Tai Tui Vasa in the main event. But I do think Kali Taha does have a decent chance if he is able to land some of his own power shots. I worry a little bit about his lack of activity, especially in a matchup like this one. But I do think he can make his own shots count for a little bit more. Now, I think this is going to be a really fun fight, if I'm being honest. For Kali Taha, he needs this one if he wants to stay in the UFC, and this is a great UFC debut for Kionez on a fairly big card, if we're being honest. Like, I really do think this card is bigger than your average fight night card that isn't in London, basically, because this fight night has got a lot more hype around it than I had ever expected upon initial review of the card, so I think this is a phenomenal opportunity for both guys, but I am still ever so slightly going to pick Kali Taha. I do like the physicality that he does bring into the cage, and I don't mind the wrestling that he can go to if things are getting sticky for him on the feet. I think his top control is decent. It's not great by any means, but it's good enough to win moments, win minutes, and I think that can help him in the judges' scorecard if it does end up going to decision. I don't like his wrestling at all. I don't like his defensive wrestling, but I think his boxing is going to get him into that range a lot to where if he has to go in on the hips, it's something he can use as like a plan B. So for Kinones, he did open up as the underdog. Still there. Kinones open plus 130, minus 101. So a slight underdog now at this point for Taha. Open minus 150, minus 120. I have Christian Kinones. I like the well-roundedness in his game. And when I look at Khalid Taha, it's a lot of power. It's a lot of energy. In the fight against Howie Barcelos, it's a fight of the night. But he took a... He took a beating in that fight. How like, he's like a borderline ranked fighter at the time, though, and now he's fighting someone making their debut. So I would say it's a big drop off in competition. Yeah, and I mean, AG saying big step down. Kinones is short notice coming from Mexico. Going to give Taha the fight he wants. Easy win. It is on short notice for uh, Mr. Christian Kinones in this matchup. And if you do look at it for Khalid Taha, he was supposed to be taking on Taylor Lapalus out of France, a long rangey striker. So Ada Camp already you know, set for a similar fighter. So it'll be interesting to see how he adjusts in this one for Kinones. He's been out since 2021. When you get that win on Contender Series, nice one there. Matter next fight, Benoit Saint-Denis take on Gabriel Miranda. Mr. Fly Miranda, a guy who had experience with Brave CF. The last promotion he was with, Face the Danger, which sounds like a, like a Warren Zyder song. Like, ride the lightning, face the danger. But maybe that'll be his next song. Uh, big red flags on their topology page because there's padded records and fighters fighting fighters who are old and with long layoffs, up weight classes. Like, it's just really weird stuff. But what you can gauge out of the tape study when you do watch Gabriel Miranda, great jujitsu, forward pressure. He throws the kitchen sink of strikes at you. He just kind of walks you down to clinch you to take you down. He's an upper body takedown artist, and he'll use like trip takedowns and body locks. So he's an interesting guy that way. His jiu-jitsu is good on top. On bottom, he has a very active guard, which is something that either really works well for you. Maybe Gabriel Miranda's the next Charles Oliveira. Who knows? And for Benoit Saint-Denis, we know the jiu-jitsu uh, is there. He's, uh, you know, accredited there, but it's his judo that really gets it done. Black belt and judo, former French special forces. For Saint-Denis, a very interesting fight that he has coming up this weekend against the UFC newcomer, where Saint-Denis was originally supposed to take on Christos Yagos, which is kind of a springboard into some bigger competition. Exactly. And for Saint-Denis, he looked great against Niklas Stutz's last time. So an interesting one in this one. Uh, Kavoth, the MMA, saying French Special Forces fighter on the Paris card fighting some can is the biggest lock this year. Yikes, using the lock word. Uh, the Goat Ramus, imagine the God of War losing to a fly. You think uh, you think Jeff Goldblum would be cool with that? I'd probably. Like fly beating the That's God of War. That's a weird movie. Will Duke saying Saint-Denis by submission. So, Matt, I think it's a good fight. Obviously, red flags with just how good Miranda is with the jiu-jitsu. But Miranda, just like Eileen Perez, not a good level of competition. I'll be honest, though. I do think there's a world out there. Mar Miranda could have a really fun UFC career. He could have five, six, seven fights, maybe three fights of the nights. I do think his style... It might not lend to wins, but we all remember Marco Polo Reyes, right? Nine and nine, he would either win by knockout or lose by knockout. Like, those are fighters that sort of make their imprint on the sport without ever actually getting into the rankings or becoming a title challenger. I do like what I've seen out of Miranda, but my issue is he's going to have to find a lot of his own success in the exact same areas Bernard Saint-Denis likes to get his own work done. And I do think Miranda is going to struggle, not only with the grappling of Saint-Denis, I think he's going to struggle with the pace of him too. And I think that's going to be a really important part of this fight. Saint-Denis is like a volume 
volume striker, but with his grappling, he's just putting a pace on you. He fights a little bit like an older Clay Guida, just with less uh, traditional takedowns, a little bit more clinch work. So I think Saint Denis at this weight class is going to be able to do some really good work. I do worry about him when he fights some of these upper echelon strikers with good takedown defense in the lightweight division. There's a lot of those guys, but I think this is another good fight for him just to get back on the horse to try to get the bad taste people might have in their mouth from the Alicia Zaleski dos Santos loss like, that he had. People want the picks and everything. I gotta be honest. There's some fights that I'm really excited about on this card. Benoit Saint Denis, Gabriel Miranda is one of them. Stoisfus Abbas uh, Magomedov is another one because Magomedov's layoff with the striking. Obviously, the fight of the nights that we mentioned. And Gomez Jarno Aarons is like, like I cannot wait. Just named wait. every fight on the card. I can't wait. So there are a lot of fights that I'm really eager to see. But Benoit Saint Denis taking on uh gabriel miranda if we have a look at the odds really quickly saint denis is a pretty big favorite open minus 185 minus 190 minus 300 right now so you get the flip side for miranda plus 241 it should be a great one i mean ian campbell saying i think saint denis will come out looking to strike i'm probably wrong you might be salvador mundi can we get an oh yeah oh yeah uh where is he I get Randy Savage. You're not somewhere. Carrot Top, Craig. You can just well, do Randy it. Randy Savage is here a couple different times in the back. So, yeah, it should be fun. Uh, the Goat Ramos, was Eileen Perez beating Tamiris Vidal before the illegal knees? Yes, she was in a gym with a cage around mats that interlocked. That was the uh, the prop that MMA is the weirdest sport. Yeah, in that one. So, interesting. I have been watching Denis in this one. I just like the power and the pressure of his grappling. And that's why I think he's not going to give Miranda a lot of space if he does. He can obviously get submitted. I, I think Miranda's another fighter that just has to prove it at the highest level. That's why I'm excited about it. And so that's why I'm excited about Perez and Miranda. As much as I might have slagged them for their level of competition, they're getting wins over who you'd expect them to get wins over. I just need to see it at the highest level before I start picking them in some of these fights. I don't know why I just thought of this, but I got into an argument the other day with somebody who I work with about how good Gennady Golovkin is. And they, I know that's a weird thing to argue with a coworker about, but he was like, he didn't fight anybody. You can't hold a gun to people's head and make them fight you when you're really, really good. Now, in boxing, there's a much more traditional way to work your way up the rankings. And that's why MMA is so weird. Like, you'll see stories every day on Twitter about how they're like, hey, we had to go back and revise somebody's record because there's all this weird stuff going around it. This stuff doesn't normally happen in other sports, and that's why MMA is the greatest. Yeah. Uh, Alex for Alex Reyes, I have Dennis in every single parlay. I LOL. I don't know about that one, guy. Uh, Matt, our next fight, we have Faras Ziam. He's back in the UFC. He's 2-2. Two two. Tough fight for him. I did do something that was a little unca... Like, I picked apart his record hard in the UFC. Because if you do look at it, the loss of Terrence McKinney, that fluky kick that ends up where he's on the mat, McKinney ends up submitting him. It is what it is. He loses to Don Madge in his debut, gets taken down, rinse and repeat. He beats Jamie Mullerkey, but by most accounts, other than the three judges that scored it, Mullerkey won that fight. So for Ziem, it's been a rocky road. He's taken on Mike Figlak, a guy who represents Poland and Great Britain as well. A guy whose brother is pining to make it to the UFC, who's what, 7-1 in his own right? For Figlak, it's really good boxing. He likes to mix it up both levels, goes to the body, goes to the head. He's got tree trunks for legs, but he doesn't really kick all that often. And he's got really good... And efficient takedowns when he needs to use them. You saw that in his last fight against Aggie Sardari, the former champ with Cage Warriors. For Figlak, decent level competition. For Farah Ziem, obviously he's got the K1 lineage. We know how explosive he can be with his striking. But to me, he's almost one of those guys that has to wait, 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 wait. Get excited. Think about striking. Think about the grappling. Now we've seen it. He trains at a jiu-jitsu gym. He works his grappling all the time. He's trying to get better at it. We haven't really seen that in the UFC so far. He's had to defend a lot of takedowns. So I think this is going to be a lot of fun, Matt. But I, I don't know. I mean, for Fire CM, it's just an odd one to bring him back into the UFC. It's a guy from France. We have a France card. Let's do it. Normally when you bring a fighter back, though, it's for a reason. And maybe that reason isn't, you know, they're going to win a title or anything. But like you said, I guess he is from the country that they're hosting this event at. But it doesn't feel like they're setting him up for success in this matchup whatsoever. Like, Figlak on the inside has far better boxing. Phariseum holds his hands really high and leaves his body wide open. That's something the Figlak will attack and take him down off of some of those entries. I just think this is a really difficult matchup for Phariseum. I wish I had more to say on this fight. I just... 
for Zeom, you're right. He's somebody who will try to wait. He is somebody who's constantly kind of thinking the game, but not in a positive way. Like, Alexander Volkanovsky is someone who can think the game, but he's always well, doing stuff. Well, he wasn't stuff. thinking when he was eating hamburgers. With he wasn't. Spoola. You can't keep your guard down with a spool. He'll catch you with a right hook. But you know what I mean? With Volkanovsky, you can kind of see the gears moving in his brain as he's doing it on the fly, as he's throwing volume. With Zeom, he's not doing anything while he's thinking, and he doesn't really have the natural power of someone like a Uriah Hall who can get away with fighting in that manner because he has such crippling power at any stage of the fight so i do like the technique out of ferris Zium. i just don't love the output I, I don't love the power and if he were able to sort of you know put the sliders up on either one of those things i do think his technique could carry him to some ufc wins i just feel like he is a little bit one-dimensional at this stage of his career and it would have been nice honestly to see him try to develop a little bit more in the regional scene kind of iron out some of those wrinkles so he could come back and become a better version of himself because i think we are just going to get the same old ferris Zium that we've got throughout his ufc tenure ryan whitaker saying Zium via decision because France I don't know if France is like Texas right? well and I was gonna ask you about that because I don't know the answer to this like Utah the last pay-per-view wanted to use a lot of their own in-house commission they didn't fly in kind of the usual uh, judges for the event I'm very curious to see how Paris or how France sorry is set up with their athletic commission because I know with some countries like the UFC is basically their own athletic commission where they'll just fly Brazil, in still they do it exactly so I I'm really curious to see kind of what the quality of the athletic commission in France is. Not a sentence I ever thought I would say in my life, but here we are. Yeah, Drew saying Figlock busting some parlays today. Figlock's about a minus 200. Uh, Faraziam plus 165, plus 170. So I'm going with uh, Figlock in this matchup, Matt, as well. It should be a fun fight while it lasts, and I'm looking forward to it. Figlock takes jobbers to the cards. If it's a close decision, Zium will get the nod uh, from the crowd. The boost, just my two cents, throwing that one in there. Yeah, well, I guess it'll remain to be seen. We have another fight in the lightweight division. John Wayne McDessie, the bull, a guy who fights about once a year, and that's not a joke. He actually has fought about once a year since 2017. Is 4-1 in his last five, and for Nazareth Hockprost, 5-4 and four in the UFC. I mean, he's lost his last two fights, albeit to Dan Hooker and, uh, you know, a tricky guy in Bobby Green. But for Hockprost, he was supposed to break through. Fight Night Picks fans absolutely adore Nazrat Hockprost, although I haven't seen the, the Fairweather Hockprost fans out. This week, I'll be honest, I didn't see them in the comments. And for McDessie, he had a major ACL surgery and then looked like a new fighter against the younger Ignacio Bahamondes, who should be a welterweight, I would think, and miss weight in that one. McDessie pieced him up. It's a split decision on his record. But McDessie won that fight, like, hardcore won He did that eat fight. some big shots, though, I will say. But I I'll actually turn that into a positive. John McDessie wasn't really known for having the most durable of chins throughout his career. And the fact that he is starting to eat some more clean shots, uh, it does make me feel a little bit better about him in this matchup. But this fight really does feel to me like, hey, Mom, can we have Nazareth hack for ass? We've got Nazareth hack for ass at home, and that would be John McDessie. Well, I mean, Butterbowl saying McDessie, Laval represent, Halifax represent, uh, Milwaukee represent, uh... Arizona represent Philadelphia Miami was, saying la, 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 la. it just it is wild sort of the career that John McDessie has had because at one point he was like a really good unranked fighter and then he became like a bit of a journeyman then he became a gatekeeper now we don't really know what he is because he sort of passed some of those skill checks so now you know I almost said a really bad challenge Gambino quote but I won't uh but for Nazareth Hackpress, the problem is, I think his hand speed's really going to be trouble for John McDessie. And I know he hasn't really let his hands go as of late, but I think that's more because of his recent opponents and not because of him as a fighter. If you look at someone like Bobby Green, one of the few volume strikers that can actually out-volume a guy like Nazareth Hackpress, and Hackpress was never able to get on the inside of Bobby Green's range. I know Green's not really thought of as one of the bigger fighters in this division, but he fights very tall. He's someone who uses his range extremely well, will use the jab and his footwork, which makes him seem a lot bigger than he really is. I think Hackpress is going to learn from some of those prior losses and put on a good performance against John McDessie. But I think this is a good fight for both guys at this stage of their careers because for McDessie, he's still trying to prove that he can be that fighter he once was. And for Hackpress, wants to, you know, assure us that the hype is real. And that's the trouble. Like, McDessie throws decent volume on the feet. He can strike with decent strikers. Obviously, you know, you're taking on some of the upper echelon guys like Cerrone when they were kind of in that title eliminator that john mcdessie didn't know about. he got head kicked and said no moss it was yeah, tough he didn't know he was in a title eliminator but he was but if you do look at it for mcdessie obviously excels in the striking for nazareth hockprost excels in the striking and not the wrestling department we saw dan hooker with the ability to take him down but alexander munoz who's a wrestling coach at team alpha male struggled with the wrestling against hockprost so i like hockprost in this matchup the power the southpaw aspect to a matchup like this obviously there are things that mcdessie's seen in the past 
And again, I do see it uh, in the comment section. Who was it? You're up there somewhere. It wasn't Drew who said you shall not pass John McDessie. It was Ben Leibson who said McDessie simply too old for this matchup. Uh, guys, I thought the same thing when he took on Ignacio Bahamondes and McDessie looked pretty darn good in that matchup. So I'm staying away from this one. Pop and popcorn. I've got hack press. You've got hack so press. I, yeah. All right, we'll move on to the next matchup. Should Matt. be a fun fight though. And I can't stress that enough. Like that fight entertainment wise is definitely going to deliver. Yeah, 100%. Dustin Stoisfus is taking on Abus Magomedov. And if you look at this matchup, Matt, Abus Magomedov, very, very interesting character. He's out of Germany, fights out of UFD, one of the premier gyms in Europe. And... For Magomedov, such a good striker. Oh, both yeah. both stances, inside, outside, great with his range management. For Dustin Steisfus, throws power shots to clinch, to get you down, and he is going to try and attack you with his bread and butter and his grappling. Obviously, his jiu-jitsu is on point. You saw it in his last fight, lose the first round of the striking to Dwight Grant, picks it up round two, picks it up round three, gets his first win in the UFC. And for Dustin Steisfus... Low-key murderer's row, his first three fights. Kyle Dawkins, he takes on uh, Adolfo Vieira and then Gerald Mearshart. They gave him three really good grapplers in this middleweight division. Now he gets a striker in Magomedov. Magomedov's last loss, PFL 2018 tournament finale against Lewis Taylor, one teammate of Bilal Muhammad. Lewis Taylor can bang, bro. Yeah, I think this is going to be a, a very, very interesting fight because it's a skill check for Magomedov in his UFC debut. A guy that was signed back in 2021, he's had two fights fall apart, and this one now becomes a short-notice matchup for these two guys. It was agreed upon a month ago, a week after Stoisfus beat Dwight Grant. So not that short notice. Stoisfus gets to stay in the gym getting ready. And for Stoisfus, he's been over in Europe getting ready for this one. He trained and he's been billed out of uh, Germany for a long time himself as well. So I think this is a great matchup, Matt, between Abu Magomedov and Dustin Stoisfus. I agree. And it's going to be a really interesting fight to see what version of Magomedov we get. Because let's say he isn't having a lot of success with his own striking. He is on the back foot a lot. We're going to learn a lot about this fighter. And now, the weird thing about Dustin Stoisfus is, like you had said, did not have a very good run his first three fights. But he beat an old kind of former welterweight like his last win was over a guy who a lot of people did expect stoy spitz to win and he did look good against dwight grant but it's just sort of hard to Dwight of... grant to beat him okay but just because i picked him to lose like he had lost three fights in a row going into that Grant was a favorite he fought a 40 year old who fought at a weight class under him beating him doesn't change my mind on dustin stage foot whatsoever if that's what i'm getting at like i think he can go out there and have a lot of success with his grappling my issue with stage foot is his wrestling isn't as good as his jiu-jitsu is and it does feel like that's the part of his game that has to catch up because he is a decent striker he is a good grappler he just doesn't necessarily have the in-between that he can go to time after time after time think about a guy like kevin lee kevin lee got rocked by a wheel kick against edson barbosa almost got knocked out on his feet but his wrestling Wrestling is so dominant that he immediately just shot in on the hips, got his head out of trouble, and was able to have success. If Stoichfus had more traditional takedowns like that in his repertoire, I think he could have a lot of success ducking under some of the bigger exchanges from Mega Medoff, but I do think he is going to struggle on the back foot in this matchup, especially if he gets up against the cage. Mega Medoff, someone who can throw in combination and single shots too, and I think that's one position that... Listen, I'm sure you don't want to be in a lot of bad positions with Mega Medoff, but if he is able to get Stoichfutz up against uh, the cage behind those two black lines, I really do think Mega Medoff can have a lot of success that way. To me, this feels like a trap card fight. Mega Medoff open a minus 220. He's a minus 291 average. Stoichfutz open plus 185, plus 232. And the reason I say that, Mega Medoff has been off for a really long time. Obviously, his last win almost two years ago against Cesare Kezik over with KSW. He gets that guillotine where... Like, he pulled it, they rolled, it was crazy, it was a front choke at the start, they have it as a guillotine, but Magomedov, just in general in the fights, if you go back and watch it, has a lot of those defensive submissions off of his opponent's takedowns, kind of like Simon Oliveira at 135, Good example. it's a big part of Magomedov's game, so I think it's going to be fun, again, I'd stay away from this one, because Magomedov's had that lengthy layoff, he could either look like, you know, great, or he could look terrible, and Stoisfist can definitely capitalize. Obviously, Stoisfist's win over Joe Pfeiffer still rings true to this day. So, so both at Mega Meta? Yeah, both of us with Mega Meta. No switch of the pick there. So, Matt, we have a look at our next fight. I mean, we have Charles Jordan taking on Nathaniel Wood. Air versus the prospect. I've got the Air Jordans behind us. 
So there, the Air Jordan with a guy who's from Quebec. It's got GSP on there, so a lot of fun there. But, uh, Matt, I think this is going to be an amazing fight. I mean, featherweight, absolutely on fire. For Jordan's last time out, majority of people thought that he was able to get the win over Shane Burgos, depending on how he scored the first and the second round, I guess, whether he had a 10-8 in the second round, and who ultimately won the first. But regardless, Jordan has been having competitive fights in the UFC for some time now. Craziest part is he's 4-4-1, four, four, but they've been very competitive for Nathaniel Wood. Obviously, a couple of stumbling blocks against a goat at flyweight and bantamweight, John Dodson. And then, of course, I wouldn't want to fight John Dodson without gloves on. I'll tell you that for free. Oh, 100%. Him and his brother, they love bare knuckle Ryan fighting. Benoit tried and did not succeed in that matchup. Those boys love it. But when you look at Nathaniel Wood, the fight of the night against Casey Kenny, very up and down, very close. And then he looked great his last time out. The featherweight debut, the skill check a few years away, looked really good against Charles Rosa, passed that test. So I think this is a great fight. Start of the week, we were split on the pick. And again, I, this, this is again one of those fights that I'm so anti. Oh yeah, and I can't disagree with anything you had said about Nathaniel Wood at the start of the week. And hopefully you can't disagree with anything I said about Jules Day at the no, start of the week. No, 100%. This is one of those fights where one guy's going to win, one guy's going to lose. It's a sport, you know what I mean? Like, it just, it happens that way. Like Chael Sonnen says, sometimes you do everything right, just the other guy was better. For Nathaniel Wood, though, this is going to be an interesting fight. And this was my big sort of X factor, and I don't really remember if I brought it up in the original prediction video, but Nathaniel Wood gets tagged clean a lot in his fights. Even if you go back to his Cage Warrior days, like, I thought Nathaniel Wood was going to come into the UFC and have, like, a Justin Gaethje career. Back in Cage Warriors, he'd eat a shot to give a shot. He was in some of the great fights of all time. Like, I highly recommend going back and watching him. Not in the regional scene, because Cage Warriors is a pretty big organization. But you get the idea. This is a guy who can face adversity, come back from it, rely on his technique, rely on his well rounded game and have a lot of success no matter what stage the fight takes place at whether it's striking clinch work or wrestling my problem is though if you are a guy who is known for getting tagged moving up a weight class against Jolde who has interesting power like I don't think Charles Jolde has the best knockout power in the division I say he has good knockdown power I think that's he, a good way that I'd say I, it I, like you look at 145 right now Volkanovski's your champ nobody can seem to beat him Max Holloway's kind of hanging out Yair out there Rodriguez yeah you're hanging out Brian Ortega is hanging out Korean Zombie is he retired that's isn't it. he retired Sean Jordan feels like the biggest fan favorite maybe it's just our channel maybe it's the fact hey. that we're Canadian there's so many people that rally around Sean Jordan fight week he's the new Nasrat Hawk Prest of our channel I would say him. that. I don't know if I'd mention him with the likes of like a Yair or a Brian Ortega or anything no, like that. No, but he's a fan favorite. Oh, definitely. And that's the great thing about MMA. Like, Charles Jordan does pass all the checks when it comes to personality and stuff like that. You kind of get to know him outside of his social medias and stuff. A fun guy, you could say, if you're Kawhi Leonard. <laughs> but his fighting style is all anybody cares about. Like, that's what I found really interesting about this year in general. The number one selling pay-per-view this year, Charles Oliveira versus Justin Gaethje. Do you know how many bad words those guys said to each other? None. They're just both really exciting fighters and people like watching them fight. Charles Jordan, I agree with you, is cut from that cloth. You want to see his fights more than anything just because they are really fun. This is a weird fight, though, because I don't know if the winner gets a ranked opponent next. Like, these are two guys who have a lot of promise, are very skilled. I just don't really know what a win does for them. So, I still pick Charles Jordan because, again, I, I like the body kicks. I think some of his bigger combinations to the head are going to have good effect. But this is an incredible fight. You look at Charles Jordan, and we talked about this at the start of the week, and it was kind of my point. It's a lot of peaks and valleys. And that's a thing that I don't necessarily love when I match him up with Nathaniel Wood. Now, I agree with you. This feels like one that could go either way. I can definitely see Charles Jordan winning. You look at his last fight against Shane Burgos. Round one, round three, he was on fire. He beat Shane Burgos at Burgos' specialty. When he gets in that flow, it's that tough to stop. Got Burgos to the top 15. Like, you guys you guys realize that there's a lot of Jordan fans in the comment section, like I said. But with Nathaniel Wood coming up a weight class, we saw the activity. He was able to keep it steady all three rounds against Rosa. Rosa's not close to the rankings, but you need that stepping stone after being away from, what was it, like late 20, 2020? I think it was October 2020 to then July 2022. Obviously, I've seen the activity question mark. Both of these guys fought fairly recently for Burgos uh, and Jordan and Wood and Rosa. But I like the steadiness out of Nathaniel Wood. Now, the only thing is... Is he able to keep that pace going in the third round? We're going to find that out this weekend. When it comes to wrestling, Charles Jordan with the slickest submission ever against a great wrestler in Lando Venata. That was wild. So there's an X factor for Jordan against a guy like Wood. But again, I like the steadiness of Wood. I like the crisp boxing out of Wood. Not to say that Jordan doesn't have it. The southpaw aspect of Jordan, we talk about it every time. His kicks to all three levels you love. Nathaniel Wood has one of the better leg kicks you're going to see. So I like that out of him. 
but how does it play against the southpaw? We're going to find that out today. It's an amazing fight. We're, oh, yeah. we're split on the pick. And then the next fight, Matt, like, you, you get Jordan Wood, and then you get Gomez Aarons. And maybe Gomez Aarons should come before Jordan Wood, because it's going to be a tough act to follow, it I would be. think. But this is another one of those fights that you can really rally around. For William Gomez, his background, he's a, a national champion or junior national champion in Sonda. Got into that at a young age. You love his striking skills. He is also a southpaw. He will also throw some kicks, but they're a little wonky. They're not as often as you're going to see from Charles Jordan. Gomez loves to throw that check right hook. Likes the boxing combination in most of his fights. But when he gets backed up a lot and when he faces wrestlers, he kind of waits for the big actions, the big shots. For Jarno Aarons, I mean, this is a guy, constant forward pressure, judo in his back pocket, loves the throws, loves, in his hands. loves the top pressure. Aaron struggles against pure wrestlers in certain spots. Gomez loves to wrestle, even though he's a striker. It's like the weird X factor of his game. So I think it's going to be a lot of fun, Matt. Uh, over in the comment section, Ryan's saying Aaron's face looks like when you mirror half somebody's face. So are you saying like perfect symmetry, like Shania Twain? I don't get it. Uh, Re is saying go miss round two, submission or knockout. And thanks for the feedback. Well, hey, thanks for the feedback. UFC finally in Paris. I, just looking at this fight, Matt, I said it at the start of the week and I'm still in this camp. I don't see why William Gomez is this big of a favorite in this matchup because it feels like both guys are really evenly matched, which shaded me towards the Aaron side. But again, when I looked at this one just on paper at the start, I was thinking of going with Gomez. I looked at the odds and everything, and then I, I considered Aaron's in this one. But this is another one. I think it's going to be an amazing fight. I think it should be too, but you're right. This is going to be a hard act to follow after Jolda versus Nathaniel Wood. The weird thing about Gomez is I agree with you on his kicks, but every now and then he'll get into a combo where he'll throw like four in a row, and that's really weird to me because you're right. He'll use his boxing, try to open uh, his opponent up with his boxing to then use his kicks. But every now and then, like on the retreat, he'll try to throw a body kick at like a weird point and against some upper echelon wrestlers, especially in the featherweight division. Those are things that are going to get you caught at a certain point. Like, Josh Emmett exists, and he exists in this weight class, and he's someone who can take advantage of a lot of those holes. Now, I know I just compared one of the best fighters in the division to two people making their UFC debuts, but you kind of get the idea. Like, these are the parts of their game that both guys are going to have to improve upon as they go up the rankings, but I'll be completely honest. I think you're going to see a lot from both of these guys in the next few years. This isn't a case of, oh, well, the loser's then going to go on a four-fight losing streak and we never hear from them again. I think Jarno could have a very long and successful career, and I think the same for William Gomez. Uh, Prince Vegeta saying Gomez thinks he's head and... Sh and tails better than him i don't think so guys like go and watch some of these william gomez interviews and if you need to turn on the closed captioning this guy seems like the most mild man or great interview i've seen yeah. in a long time he's got a ton of confidence but he's he's really personable i i really think william gomez is going to go far and the same thing for netherlands journal aaron so i have aaron's you have gomez but i think it's going to be a great fight and i saw two uh, just my two cents saying speed and striking advantage he definitely has the more well-rounded skill set when it comes to his striking the thing that i hate is Every single go miss fight, he goes for the clinch, he goes for the takedowns, and if you listen to his corners, they're yelling at the top of their lungs for him to disengage and continue striking. And I hate that against a guy like Jarno Aarons, who I consider to have a grappling edge over Gomez. That's my X factor. I think that judo is going to play out for Aarons. I think both guys have taken on good levels of competition. I think this is a great fight, and I'm glad it's on the main card. And it's better than some main card fights that are on UFC 279 next weekend. So it should be a fun one while it lasts. You're really selling that pay-per-view well, Craig. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to paying for Irene Aldana, Macy Chasson. That's Great fight. Irene Aldana, a former main eventer for the UFC. Yeah, Alessio Di Kirkos taking on Roman Kopilov. Matt, this is a fight that exists. It is. In 2022, Alessio Di Kirko won him four in his last five, but that won. That one's a wild head kick knockout. And for Alessio Di Kirko, well-rounded, decent power. That's it, right? Pretty much. I mean, for Roman Kopilov, hasn't won a fight since 2018. Good power, good boxing. Suspect gas tank when he grapples, but used to have a great gas tank when he was with Fight Nights Global it's in five-round fights. Roman Kopilov has that fight. Like, in his last one against Albert Duraev, he did the Luke Rockhold. Hands on your knees, hands on your knees. And then Duraev walks in, he punches him, and it looks great. It's a good highlight. Well, it's not a good highlight because you look tired and your face is bloodied up, but... When I do look at this fight, Matt, I mean, for Alessio Di Chirico, obviously more UFC experience. Obviously, you know, very long time since Kopilov's won a fight. So 
What are you making this one? Because it's a really weird fight. The good thing about Takiriko is, it's not like he's just losing to Sam Alvey and the likes. You know, he has fought a decent level of competition in the UFC. Not necessarily ranked fighters, but in the middleweight division, it's not like women's bantamweight like we had talked about, where there's, what, five, six fighters who aren't ranked? Like, in middleweight, there's 50 fighters, so it's pretty hard to become one of the top 15 in the weight class. And for Takiriko... He's steady, and I think that's probably the best way to describe his style. He's someone who can excel in some striking exchanges, like you had said, but he's also weird because he'll go to the clinch a lot, especially up against the cage, and I think that could honestly be his best best path to victory against a guy like Kopulov, who, like you said, the grappling can sort of wear on him as the fight progresses, and if Takiriko can just get over hooks, under hooks, wear on him up against the cage, I think he could have really good success. My problem is, Takiriko... I feel like he has regressed a little bit in his striking. This is something we've talked about with Marcin Tabora. It's something we've talked about even with Derek Brunson as of late. Like, Derek Brunson at one point in his career was knocking fools dead, and it, like, wasn't even close. Now he's someone who almost doesn't have the same level of confidence that he once did in his striking. Same thing with Marcin Tabora. Marcin Tabora used to throw head kicks, and it was kind of wild. Now he goes for a lot more takedowns. He was always a good grappler, but you understand. He's just sort of shifted his MMA game into a different part. For Dekiriko, I think he can have success on the feet. I just don't really see if he's going to really open up with his hands. I think that's going to be something he's going to have trouble with. Not that I'm the most confident with Kopilov whatsoever, but... I do think he'll be able to get the win in this matchup. Yeah, I do like Roman Kopilov. This is another one of those fights where maybe I shouldn't have, but I went back and watched a lot of old tape on Roman Kopilov like I did for Kalitaha getting ready for his fight. Just to remember the good old days when things were going well for these guys on the come up. And it was the boxing, it was the power. So I ended up going with uh, Roman Kopilov as well. Now this is another one of those ones that could blow up in my face. Like there were so many people that got upset when I ended up taking Devin Clark to get the win his last fight out. And listen, sometimes you pick underdogs and you get them wrong. It's just a part of the game. But for Roman Kopilov, we ended up picking him when he was the underdog. He's now minus 113. So slight favorite. DiKirico minus 108. So apparently that one's changed. But it'll be interesting to see how this one goes. I see a lot of people kind of talking about the fact that this is the one that you take off. You kind of just, you, you know, you simmer and you get ready for Nasty and Imovov, Joaquin Buckley. So let's do that. Imovov Buckley, this is the one, and I haven't really touched on it, and I'll do it at the end of the show, but I do want to talk about this one first, because it is in our Instagram, it is in the story, and we talk about the votes on Instagram, and it's 60% that went with Nathrasudin Imovov over the 40% Buckley, it's 162 votes to 108, so slightly more people going with Nathrasudin Imovov over Buckley, but it's the big actions of Buckley, it's the, the, the crisp striking, the power against Nasrudin Imovov, who's going to light you up with a jab, throw a few kicks, clinch to his advantage, but to his disadvantage sometimes. It really is, though, again, those long-range strikes when Imovov's walking you down to where you have to watch out. But I've seen a lot of astute people in the comments section going with uh, Joaquin Buckley this week. And as I said at the start of the week, I was surprised, uh, you know, how far apart the odds were in this matchup, even though we disagreed on that one. This is the weird thing about this fight. For Joaquin Buckley... It's, it's very interesting. Like, the holes in his game are apparent, but so are the strengths. I talked about this a lot earlier on in the week. He loads up on his shots. It doesn't take a genius to tell you that. Anybody who's ever watched his fights know he loads up on his shots. The thing is, when he lands them, nobody can withstand his power. That is the thing about Joaquin Buckley. I, he's probably not the most heavy-handed fighter in this weight division, but I would say he's up there. Like, he would be in that top tier for power punchers. Now, uh, does he have everything else to actually get himself up into, like, the top 10, top 5? It's yet to be seen. But against a guy like Nasty Nimovov, who can strike on the back foot, who does read his opponents very well, especially with the striking, I think having such an apparent weakness in your overall game is going to show. And for Imovov, it's going to be really interesting, because if he does eat that big shot early, people are going to completely forget about him and write him off forever. And for Buckley, I gotta be honest, I'm kind of surprised to see where the votes were on Instagram because I assumed Imovov, just with his overall technical prowess, would be a much bigger favorite, at least in the fans' eyes. Now, I understand Joaquin Buckley with the highlight reels, he's probably the more known commodity out of these two fighters. That's probably got him a little bit of respect with the fans, but... I think Imovov's the much more technical guy in this matchup, and that's someone we normally pick on this channel. I know every now and then we'll throw a weird curveball and pick the knockout artist, but I really do feel like the technique of Imovov is going to cause Buckley a lot of troubles. Yeah, I mean, Imovov opening a minus 180, minus 256, and I saw the comments about, uh, you know, uh, the height difference in this one. It, it is apparent. It is a big thing, but I mean... Think of it like Roy Nelson knocked out Stefan Struve. That was something that to happened. To quote really. son and Stefan Struve was only in the UFC because he was seven feet tall. Well, six eleven and a half is what they marketed him as. But Matt, I do have Nasty Imovov in this one again. 
I love the striking prowess. I don't love the fact that for minutes on end in his fights, he gets held up against the cage and he has to get out of it. Now, for Imabov, he saw it against Shabazian. He turned that last takedown attempt into a submission and then he turned that into a mounted crucifix. So Imabov is adept in certain positions and he is a middleweight that can sweep off bottom. But Joaquin Buckley, big guy, ground and pound, heavy shots. I wouldn't, uh, you know, ever get upset if somebody was going to say, hey, I'm taking Joaquin Buckley. Listen, I'm here for it. You let us know who you got in these matchups. Our co-main event, the Reaper, Marvin Vittori. Listen, Patty Pimlet did the old, hey, oh, and then he was able to get the win over Jordan Levin. Marvin Vittori did it, but then he did like a this. It's kind of lame. Marvin Vittori didn't like the handshake. Uh, doesn't, hasn't really shown Robert Whitaker a ton of respect. Robert Whitaker on the flip side has said Marvin Vittori hasn't shown me any respect. So it's like really awkward. I think it's a great fight. I think it's going to be a lot of fun because for Vittori, He's lost in the UFC to Israel Adesanya. Now, for Robert Whitaker, he's lost to, you know, obviously a few other fighters. For Robert Whitaker, though, usually two wins over Yoel Romero gets you into the UFC Hall of Fame. Might not be enough for Robert Whitaker. I think it's still I think is. their second fight will get into the Hall of yeah, Fame. I, yeah, I think it still is. But for Whitaker, obviously his last time out against Adesanya as well didn't go his way. For Vittori, picked up the pieces, had a really competitive fight against Paulo Costa that's great on a rewatch. And for Whitaker, you know, trying to get a, another win in this one to keep it relevant at number one in the division. So it's a great fight. It's really well put together. I'm glad that we get it. I wish it was five rounds. Like, I, I don't think I can I stress that one enough. So maybe the next time Mick Maynard goes to put one of these ones together, he goes with five rounds. But what's the pick in this one? Because it's a really good fight. It is. And it's a fight where, again, you can make a very competitive argument for either side of it. The thing is, I really like the footwork out of Robert Whitaker in this matchup. And I know I'm someone who brings up Marvin Matori every single week as pretty much the best example for someone who can strike their way into the clinch and then weaponize that with their own takedowns and with their pace. The problem is, he's fighting one of the few men in the UFC who doesn't get tired. And I feel 100% comfortable saying that like robert whitaker is up there in the hall of fame for cardios he can move he can strike for volume he can strike for power i know i've been a little bit critical of robert whitaker's power as of late because it has been a while since he has uh, got a stoppage win i believe it was 2017 when he fought shocker and that was a number of years ago by now but it's not like his strikes aren't damaging and i think that's the important point that i want to bring up it's not that he isn't getting knockout wins anymore he's still hurting people on the feet think about jared cannonier hit him with that one two head kick put him down had him basically out of that fight and then cannonier was able to rally and look a little bit better as it was going on but my point is this is one of the few opponents where Marvin Vittori won't just be able to put a pace on them and win because of his physicality and because of his cardio and I think that'll be really interesting uh just puzzle to see Robert Whitaker try to solve well Malone Hart hitting up the super chat with a really good question y'all think this could be a snoozer because they're both so tactical and hard to catch I think if Whitaker wins no I think for Vittori he's got to cut the cage he's got to implement those boxing combinations that really have gotten him to this point and obviously for both these guys Vittori's critique against Whitaker is hasn't leveled up same fighter and I've leveled up and I don't necessarily agree but at the same time we have seen an evolution for Vittori since he's aligned with King's MMA oh, yeah. he's definitely gotten better he's not the guy that came into the UFC the other thing for Vittori and people were a little critical on this is the fact that you kind of mentioned Whitaker 170 and then he moved up to 185 Marvin Vittori's fought at 205 but Marvin Vittori was a, was a welterweight before he even came into the UFC. Been so a while, though. Welterweight experience for both guys, but it just has to be said. So for Johnny B. Great saying Marvin about to get styled on, and for Cole Hughes, I don't see how you could pick Vittori. Well, Cole, get ready for it. Because I like Vittori with the fact that he pushes such a good pace. He's very economical with it. Both guys with so much five-round experience. But for Vittori, what I like is, again, cutting the cage, limiting the range. Whitaker hits on the hot beat, and I talked about that. I said... If Whitaker gets the win, it's all of the striking. It's the accumulation of volume. And for Whitaker, it's the strikes from odd angles that really get guys caught. But I like Vittori with the steadiness. I like him with the fact that he doesn't necessarily need the takedown against Whitaker. I think really he does. Good. Take, no, he can just clinch him up and make it boring. I, see, Robert Whitaker's never just been held in the clinch, though. He's someone who's really good at digging underhooks and pushing off near guys' necks. And he's just really good at that. Like, Robert Whitaker's never been taken down in the UFC other than one time against Yoel Romero where he immediately got back up after he tore his ACL. Like, I know there's another example. I'm sure there is. That's the only time that comes to mind where Robert Whitaker's ever been taken down in his career. He has some of the Gastelum, great... Gastelum, Romero, Romero, he... Souza... He popped up immediately That's in all of... He had never been controlled on the mat. That's a really important point. 
Those are some of the greatest grapplers ever, too. And I, I'm Rafael just saying, Natal? Rafael Natal at one point was a really good grappler. He got destroyed by Robert Whitaker, though. The problem is, I think Marvin Vittori does need the takedown in this fight to win. I don't think he can strike with Robert Whitaker whatsoever. I think he can do well enough to not get knocked out. I think he's defensively sound enough to avoid some of the big shots. I just really do think he's going to need the takedown. I guess that's all I was going to say. So, do you think that's how Marvin Vittori is going to fight? Just strike his way into the clinch and just try to wear on Whitaker as the fight goes on? Yeah, I, and I think Vittori, I mean, a lot of people are forgetting about this, and you can slag on the competition, but it was a relevant talking point in the fight. Remember Marvin Vittori's fight against ja uh, Jack Romanson? His striking yeah. really was on point in that one. His volume was good. His range was good against a range. We call striker. out Jack Romanson, though, for being uncomfortable on his feet all the time. But it was a really good matchup. Again, all of these reasons why I have Vittori. I can make an argument for Robert Whitaker. I could switch my pick if that's what you want me to do, but I'm not going to do it. No, no, you can do whatever you want to. It's just I'm trying to figure out why you're picking Vittori. That's all. I made an 11-minute video at the start of the week. I think I that should be good enough. Craig. I'm just saying. Jumping, Matt. Well, main event time. Tai Tuivas is taking on Cyril Gaon. Why does Tai Tuivasa the Wayans do that? I don't know. Every time, it's weird. Shui Vasa, it's a guy who gets it going, Matt. And there's a lot of flavor going into this matchup. They did that weird rose ceremony, bachelor thing. I didn't think it was all that funny. No animosity between these men whatsoever. Like, it's weird. They, yeah. Like, not that they're best friends. I don't think this is going to be a C. Madero's cowboy where every two seconds they're like, come here, buddy. The other thing that but, I find weird, too, is the fact that the UFC is going to fly you, but we're going to fly the coach. I mean, a guy in a main event. Who is he, coach. Juan Soto, after demanding a trade? Yeah, like, oh, you got to buy your own first class plane ticket. That's kind of, that's a doozy. That's a bad look. This is the weird thing about this fight, though. I've seen a lot of people throughout the week make a lot of arguments for why Vittori can win and why Joaquin Buckley can win. And I would say they're not sizable underdogs, but they are decent size, moderate underdogs, let's call them. For Tatui Vasa, I have to be completely honest with you. I think he has a much better chance to win his fight as a big, big underdog, even though I'm not picking him. Let me get that very clear. <laughs> Uh, then a lot of these other underdogs do. And it's not just because of the fact that he's got power. And in heavyweight, if anybody lands, that's how they can win. Like, it doesn't really matter who you are. If you weigh 260 pounds and you land a clean strike, you're probably going to knock somebody out. But with Tai Tuivasa, his success is in that one little part of his game where Cyril Gaon, not that he's unproven in it, it's just he doesn't really react the best to it. If Tai Tuivasa rushes forward, rushes forward, and does just try to blitz him, let's say, in that first round, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how Cyril Gaon reacts to that pressure. Does he go for the takedown? Is he comfortable enough on his feet to just sort of try to strike on the back foot like we saw against Jarzinho or like we saw against Alexander Volkov? I think this is going to be a very interesting fight, not because Tai Tuivasa is going to pull off this crazy upset, but just to see how Cyril Gaon rebounds off his last loss. And that that really is the biggest question that we have in this one because for Cyril Gaon, obviously the kickboxing experience. Now, if you watch Dana White's Contender Series, and I implore you, you should, because the fights have been great since week one. Week two to six have been really good. And if you're missing the live show, this is what I have to say. We had a fight in the co-main event of this week's Contender Series that is reminiscent of Gaon versus Tuivasa. You had SD or Cedriquez Dumas taking on Matei Peñas. And if you watch that fight, Peñas is a glory uh, kickboxing whiz, and he was undefeated in MMA. And Dumas had great power, but hadn't fought a good level of competition. And in that fight, that's your talking point. Gaon is like Peñas in this matchup. Kickboxing experience. He was a champ with TKO. He was a champ with the UFC. He was undefeated. He struggled against wrestling against, you know, France and Ganu. I really doubt you're going to see that out of Tai Tuivasa. But on the flip side, Dumas had the well-roundedness to his game, but it really was his striking. It's just MMA striking versus pure kickboxing. Now, where I bring it back is the fact that Cyril Gaon has adjusted so well to the MMA striking, and that's why I like him in a matchup against Tai Tuivasa. But, as Prince Vegeta son says... Ty will throw Gon into the crowd, and then I don't know French beers. So what beer would he have? I, sure. I actually don't know French beers. I should. <laughs> really? You maybe wake we'll up just, and you're like, I need maybe, to learn more about French Maybe they'll just throw him a Carlsberg. That's out of Europe. It would be wild to see Ty Tuivasa knock out Cyril Gaon, though. I'm not going to lie. That'd be one of the craziest things we've ever seen. Just It's weird when a heavyweight contender gets stopped for the first time. It's always strange to me. Like, you can lose by decision. That's fine. But, like, if we ever get to the day where Francis Ngannou gets flatlined, I don't know if I'm going to be able to, like, just not lose my effing mind because that would just be wild. Here's the thing, though, for Cyril Gaon. He's great with his range management, and that's really what Tai Tuivasa is going to have to rely on if he wants to win. Maybe Tuivasa can go to some light kicks like we saw a lot more earlier on in his career. He still throws them, don't get me wrong. He's just a little bit more boxing heavy. If he throws a lot of light kicks, again, very interesting to see how Cyril Gaon adapts to uh, what Tai Tuivasa brings to him. But Cyril Gaon's a very cerebral fighter. He's good at most ranges. He had a really bad loss his last time out, uh, but... 
this is a great rebound opportunity. You can't just let that one loss to Francis Ngannou completely cloud your memory of uh, Cyril Gunn. He looked great against Derek Lewis. He looked really good against Volkov. I'll be honest. Good against GDS. The Jarzinho fight was terrible. Let's just call it what it is. JDS was a little over the hill, if we're being honest, too. I know he was able to beat Tai Tuivasa, but still, that was still sort of late career JDS. So, for Gone, I would still really like to see him fight Curtis Blades at some point, and I feel like that's kind of next no matter what. So, I'll say the winner of this gets Curtis Blades, but I still like Cyril Gone. I'd love to see Cyril Gone and John Jones, but that's just me. And did you see that video? It was almost like a Billy on the Street type, the guy interviewing, and there were three women. And he's like, which celebrity would you want to go out on a date? Francis Ngannou! <laughs> Francis Ngannou! What?! Wow. She's the coolest chick ever. Yeah. Francis Ngannou. So Fight Night Picks question. Probably not picks. into guys who look like us then. Well, Francis Ngannou, uh, you know, a great champion. And he's pining for a turn early 2023. He's got a few more muscles than I do. So you'll love to see that one. But Matt, as we always do with question mark kicks, we re-up the deck. We go through all of these ones. I'll mention the votes and the picks over Fight Night Picks. Uh, Instagram story is where you can find those ones. So first fight on the card, you have Eileen Perez taking on Stephanie Edgar. 60% of the fans going with Edgar. I have Edgar in the matchup. You have Edgar in the matchup. The fans in the comments section all have Eileen Perez. They love You're her. really hung up on that. They uh, love Perez. I've I mean, got Edgar. I, I'm not that concerned, though. All right, Matt. The next fight, Khalid Taha taking on uh, Teco Quinones' brother, Problema, Christian Quinones. 53% of the fans have Quinones. I have Quinones, but you don't. I have Taha. I think this is going to be a really fun fight, though. I, I really do. I'm looking forward to it. All right, Matt. Benoit Saint-Denis, Gabriel Miranda. 91% of the fans have Benoit Saint-Denis. That's uh, insane. It's 230 votes to 24 votes for Miranda. I have Saint Denis in this matchup. Here's the problem with MMA, though, and having 90% of people pick anything. It's wild. It's stupid. Anybody can win this sport at any minute because the gloves are so small and knockouts happen just like that, and it doesn't really matter. Yeah, so that's just, like upsets like this happen fairly often in MMA. Exactly. That's why anytime someone's like a minus 1,000 and someone's like, wow, I think that's a smart bet, I think it's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Tony the Greek. So. I, I do like uh, Benoit St. Denis in this matchup. Uh, Matt, the next one. Faris Ziem taking on Mick Figlock in this one. Or sorry, Mike Figlock. 61% going with Figlock to 39% with Faris Ziem. I have Figlock in this matchup as well. I think this is going to be a bit of a showcase performance from Figlock. And I think we're going to get a lot more hype from him going further after this event. John McDessie taking on Nazrat Hakparast. And again, the order and now in the Instagram stories all messed up because he changed the order in the real one. Uh, so in this matchup, 77% going with Hawk Brass to the 23% that I have McDessey. Maybe it's recency bias. Maybe it's the fact that a lot of Fight Night Picks fans are Hawk Brass fans. But uh, I do have Hawk Brass in this matchup. I think it should be fun. I think he's the younger guy. I think he's a little bit more durable at this stage of his career, too. We haven't really seen Hawk Brass get hurt all that much in the octagon. So I think these guys do get in sort of those one-for-one -one exchanges. I do see Hawk Brass getting the better of a lot of them. But again, this is going to be a really fun fight to watch. Stoisvitz Magomedov. I have Magomedov, but I have so many red flags about this match matchup the long layoff Stoisvis finally getting the win the confidence both guys you know getting ready for this matchup similarly and for Magomedov 78% of the fans on Fight Night picks time to get the win I have him in this matchup yeah, I also like Megamedov. Again, for Sturgis, he's probably going to have to grapple quite a bit in this match if he's going to want to win. I worry about him a little bit trying to go into those engages because he could eat a big power shot from Megamedov. And again, if Megamedov's the one who's pushing the action, really leading the dance, if you will, I think he'll definitely win. All right, Matt. So the next one, we have Jordan versus Nathaniel Wood. Possible fight of the night. 76% of the Fight Night Picks fans have Charles Jordan to get the win. And I have Nathaniel Wood. I like Charles Jordan in this matchup. Again, this is a fight of the night screen fight for a reason because it's going to be very competitive. It's a really fun matchup. Again, going to be really interesting to see how Nathaniel, how Nathaniel Wood looks against a genuinely high-level featherweight because, again, the last fight against Charles Rosa, it's kind of easy to look good against him even though he did display some incredible skills in that matchup. Great leg kicks. So this is going to be a really fun fight. But, again, I've got Charles Dan. Malone Hart, super chat. So glad y'all are back at it again. Enjoy the fights. Have a good weekend. You the too, true Malone. MVP of the chat this week is Malone Hart. Matt, the next one, William Gomez versus Jarno Aarons. I have Aarons in the underdog spot. I was surprised that the odds are just so far apart, so that's why I ended up going with Aarons. But to me, it's his boxing abilities and his takedowns and his takedown defense against a guy in William Gomez who's more of a striker but loves to grapple, even though his corner hates that he grapples. Uncle's Gregory Babin, great fighter out of France. 
I like William Gomez in this matchup, but again, we had said this, I think, at the start of the week, and we reiterated it on question mark kicks. I think these guys are going to be around for a while at the UFC level. I don't think this will be a one and done for either guy, but I do have Gomez. That uh, should be a lot of fun. Alessio Di Kirko, Roman Kopilov. Well, I said the last one's going to be a lot of fun. I don't know about this one. It's a weird fight. It, I, I'm not really Jones for I don't know it. what the odds would be on this winning fight of the night, but I doubt they're great. Yeah. The odds, you yeah, said? Yeah, like for this to win fight of the night, it's probably oh. like a plus 50,000. Yeah, I think if anything, it's probably, uh, you know, a performance bonus if we get that. But I have Kopilov. I had him as the underdog. Now he's the favorite, so that's weird because he hasn't won a fight in almost five years. But I do have Kopilov. I like the the, the boxing uh, that he has. I like the forward pressure and the power. We just haven't seen it in the UFC. And Kyle Robertson outgrappled him, which is bad. Yeah, that's not a great sign whatsoever. uh uh I like Kopilov, but again, I don't have a lot of confidence about him moving forward against other high-level guys. All right, Matt. So the next fight, we have Imovov Buckley. I like Imovov in this one. I, obviously, the red flags are very apparent. We know this. If you pick Buckley, I'm not going to laugh in your face. I think, you know, it's a decent pick for a big underdog, but I, I like Imovov based on skill set. I just think he's a lot more technical, and the fact that he can strike off the back foot, I think he's going to be able to open up some of those uh, technical difficulties, we'll say, from Joaquin Buckley. I just don't like the fact that he ducks a lot with his power shots, and I do think is going to be able to counter. Dan Hip with the super chat. Uh, Tui Vasagon inside the distance. Whitaker Vittori to go the uh, inside the distance, and the co-main event uh, to go the distance. Parlay them at minus 110. I don't know, man. Do as you please, I guess. Not a bad part. Uh, I hate, yeah, I, I hate that that's my advice on the Super Chat, because I do appreciate it, but I just, I don't have uh, a strong read on that one, Matt. So, Whitaker, Vittori, I like Vittori as the underdog. Uh, I slipped away from going with the fan vote on Instagram, so I'll tee that up. 69% on Whitaker to 31% on Vittori. I'm in the minority with Vittori. Yeah, I think Whitaker's going to be able to counter off the back foot quite a bit. He does have really good footwork, so I think that'll be able to evade some of the cage cutting that Marvin Vittori does like to employ. But it should be a really fun fight. Like, the fact that this is not five rounds is absolutely ridiculous. And the fact that we're getting Shamaya versus Nate Diaz for five rounds next week is also kind of wild. I would have loved to see this fight be like the co-main event for next weekend's pay-per-view. Be a really good excuse yeah. to give them kind of that five round yep. uh, atmosphere. But I do have Whitaker in the co-main event, and I'm more excited for this than the main event, if I'm being completely honest. Yeah, it's it's one of those ones. I mean, you're number one ranked middleweight, you're number two ranked guy, and then in the main event, you have number one versus number three. It's Tui Vasa and gone. It's amazing to see the progression of Tai Tui Vasa, just what, he's, just what he's been able to do lately. And I mean, you consider... This weekend's co-main event, you talked about it. And then next weekend, you have Tony Ferguson and Lee Jingliang in a fight that's between a ranked welterweight and a ranked lightweight. It's just a weird one. That's a, I feel terrible for Tony Ferguson. Going with Cyril Gaon in this matchup. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's going to be uh, an interesting fight while it lasts. And if you get a big knockout at a tie to Ivasa, holy crow, give him a title shot. I don't oh, care. Yeah. If you knock him. out the number one ranked heavyweight in the world, you better get a title shot after it. The weird thing is, though, is France is fighting... Tyson Fury, I know he got knee surgery, so hopefully he's getting better. He's a little bit older, though, so you worry about how the knee surgery is going to affect him. He might be the greatest wrestler we've ever seen. He's definitely the best power puncher we've ever seen. Like, Francis Ngannou might be the most interesting man in the world. I don't know what the Dos Equis guy is doing right now, but Francis could immediately take that guy's job just like that. Francis Ngannou, the man. So, hopefully you enjoy it. It's an early card. It starts in just under an hour. It should be a good one. And, of course, again, next weekend, Shamayev versus Diaz, it's a card that features Johnny Walker taking on Iwan Kutsalaba, the return of D-Rod, Dana That's Rodriguez against Kevin Holland, uh, Dennis Tallul and Jamie Pickett, they rebooked it, Chad and Helliger, there's a couple Canadians on this card, Ann Helliger and Hakeem Dewadu, and they both train out of Calgary with Champions Creed. I think the UFC missed a golden opportunity because I've been saying this a long time, yeah you're right Aaron, I've been terrible with the Contender Series stuff lately, uh, what was I talking about right before that though? The Completely. Canadians. I certainly and Helliger wasn't. and Hakeem Daudu. I didn't talk about either one of those guys. Well, I, that was a follow-up to me, but uh, yeah, it should be an interesting guy. And Johan Linus out of, uh, you know, the oh, so short. Oh, sorry, yes. They missed a golden opportunity to put Shabkat Rachmanov on this card. I've been saying for a long time, I think Shabkat can beat Shemaev, and I've got a lot of hate in my DMs over various social medias because of it. I do think this is one of those uh, rivalries where don't match them up with each other immediately. I think they're both good enough to get to a title shot without a doubt, if I'm being completely honest. Put them on the same card together, though, and get those, like, weird background interactions that you can, like, get on tape. Have Shemaev and Shavkat, like, looking at each other on the opposite sides of the room. Try to build a storyline with that, because I genuinely believe Shemaev's going to fight Rachmana for a title at one point. Well, we'll see what happens, Matt. That card coming up next weekend. It should be a great one. Enjoy the fights today. 
Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks, and as we always say, let's, let's get, get into it. it.